Good morning. Welcome to all those who remember to set their clocks <clears throat> ahead an hour and uh, made their way through the rain this morning. So a special thank you to everybody who helped do the mopping this morning. Um, so you know um, how sometimes you go to a, a party or a shower and they have little prizes. I don't have prizes, but I'm just going to see who got the most rain. Uh, so we, where I was on the farm this morning only had an inch 85 so far so I expected that and then I got here and I heard other things so I heard Lawrence had six inches in his gauge right so anybody have more than six okay so Lawrence and Kay are the winners this morning <laughs> Lyle had as much rain but his gauge only went to five inches so <laughs> so he doesn't get the prize today anyway we had a good rain, and we're so thankful it was rain and not snow, right? If it had been snow, just imagine. So, um, welcome, and I'm so glad you all made it here this morning. I had just wanted to mention a couple of announcements. Um, you may all have heard this, but Artis Burge had um, been, she had fallen a while ago and had a lot of back pain, and it turns out she has several broken, uh, places in her lower back. Um, so she is in the hospital, but will be going tomorrow to Perkins for about a month for uh, rehabilitation and physical therapy. So um, that's what's happening with Artis, and we'll keep her in our prayers, especially right now. It's been very painful. Um, also just wanted to mention there's a lot of things to sign up for on the bulletin board. So if you haven't done that yet, check out the bulletin board. Um, Easter lilies and uh, pictures for our pictorial directory if you want to have a free family picture taken and um, all sorts of things. And the, the book club that we're doing, uh, we're going to be reading Praying for Strangers. Um, and so if you would like to get a free copy of the book, please uh, get signed up on there because I need to order the books in about a week so, so that we'll have time to read them before we meet together to talk about the book. So um, if you haven't done that yet, please sign up for a free copy of the book. Anybody have anything else? All right. If not, this morning we are beginning with a, uh, a kind of a call to worship song. You can remain seated for this one, but it's Jesus Remember Me number 616, and we'll sing it through three times. I invite you to stand as you are able as we offer our confession and receive forgiveness. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor.
Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy and hear us. Though we are poor, sinful creatures, have mercy and hear us. Though we have turned from you and grieved you, have mercy and hear us. Though we have hardened our hearts against you and against our sisters and brothers, have mercy and hear us. Though we deserve judgment, wrath, and condemnation, for the sake of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy and hear us. Forgive us, heal us, and save us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God hates nothing that he has made and forgives the sins of all those who are penitent. He will create in us new and contrite hearts so that we who worthily lament our sins and acknowledge our wretchedness may receive from him, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness. This he promises through Jesus Christ, his Son, who is our Lord, our Savior, and our righteousness forever. Amen. Please be seated for our opening hymn, which is Bless Now, O God, the Journey. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ who saves us through faith, the love of the Father who gifts us with every good gift, and the communion of the Holy Spirit who fills us with all wisdom be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord 
For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Let us pray. God of mercy, renew us daily in the gift of baptism and remind us of the promise we have through your son's cross. Let us always look to the cross as the cer and certain sign of forgiveness of sins, hope and healing in this life, and the promise of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Please be seated. Good morning. The first lesson is from Numbers 21, verses 4 to 9. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit somebody, the person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please read responsively from Psalm 107, verses 1 through 9. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he redeemed from trouble, and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to an inhabited town. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted with them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way until they reached an inhabited town. And like the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. For he satisfies the thirsty, and the hungry he fills with good things. The second lesson is from Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. You were dead through the trespasses and sin in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses. And we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. 
for are what we have made us created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand as we read the Holy Gospel. Join me in the Gospel acclamation. One does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Your words, O Lord, are spirit and life. The Holy Gospel according to John. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light. 
so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. <clears throat> Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A man fell off a cliff, but he managed to grab a tree limb on the way down. As he dangled there, sweating and terrified, trying not to look down at the canyon below him, he cried out, Is anyone up there? And God answered, I am here. I am the Lord. Do you trust me? Yes, Lord, I trust you. I really believe, but I can't hang on much longer. That's all right. If you really trust me, you have nothing to worry about. I will save you. Just let go of the branch. There was a moment of pause. And then the man shouted, Is there anyone else up there? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the human problem in a nutshell. We are not willing, in fact, not able, to trust God completely to save us. We feel compelled to contribute something, to do something, to maintain some semblance of control over our lives, and even over our God. As we continue our sermon series on American idols, we're going to look to, at one today that applies to absolutely everyone. <clears throat> Maybe you haven't succumbed to any of the other idols we've talked about, but there is no escaping this one. It's there inside of every human being ever born in this world. And that idol is control, needing to be in charge, needing to be the one making the decisions, needing, in a way, to be our own God, to be in charge of our own salvation project. There are several ways this God of control can manifest itself. The first is to reject God completely either by out and out denying his existence or, almost worse, by totally ignoring him. Outright atheists may get all the attention because they are obvious and blatant in their rejection of God, and they make an easy target. But there are plenty of people who claim to have some sort of faith, but then live their lives as if God doesn't really exist for them either. <clears throat> Some people ignore God by wallowing in their own sin and guilt, not accepting the glorious gift of forgiveness offered in Christ Jesus, and not realizing the freedom that could be theirs. Others ignore God by doing whatever they want, not accepting that God has any right whatsoever to tell them what to do or how to live not caring how their words and actions affect themselves and those around them. If they think about God at all, they might echo Heinrich Heine's classic saying. He said, I like to sin. God likes to forgive. Really, the world is admirably arranged. <clears throat> Another way that we try to maintain control of our own salvation is by relying on our own strength and ability to turn our lives around. We make resolutions to do this or that, to clean up our act and do the best we can and do better. We look at religion as a list of things to do and ways to behave and believe that as long as we're doing our best, God will reward us with a trip to heaven someday. There is, in this country at least, a pervasive belief that anyone who is a reasonably decent person will end up in heaven, regardless of whether they have any kind of faith in Jesus. 
somehow many people have gotten the idea that they are such a good person, or at least so much better than so many others, that there is no way that God would not save them. But this is not what the Bible teaches. Paul puts it quite bluntly in our reading from Ephesians 2 today. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And Jesus makes it plain in John 3 that salvation comes only through faith in him when he says those famous words, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The problem with thinking we can get into heaven by being good enough is that no one is good enough. Underneath even the saintliest exterior, there is still a sinful self, twisted and selfish. In his outstanding book, The Hammer of God, Bo Geritz explains original sin like this. I think this is really good, so I'm going to read this to you. He says, It's like when a homeowner begins to clear the land around his new house. The stones fly and the spade digs happily. But when a person is at work on the field of his heart, he gradually makes the dismaying discovery that here are more stones the deeper he gets. He keeps discovering new sins right along, and they become more difficult to move the more deeply they are entrenched in his inner life. One might possibly break with drinking and profanity and desecrating the Sabbath in a single evening. But pride, that desire to talk about oneself or to find fault with others, are likely to remain still after many months of penitential struggle. Then one day, when a man is battling sin and is trying to clear the stones from the heart's field, sweating at the task, yet hoping finally to get rid of the last ones so that he may really see the garden grow, his spade strikes solid rock. He digs and scrapes on every side. He tries again and again to budge the rock. Then the terrible realization dawns. It is stony ground through and through. When he has hauled away load after load of stone and dumped them outside the fence, he still has not succeeded in making a garden that can begin to bear fruit for God. Instead, he has laid bare a ledge of granite. It is this stony ground that explains why a man is just as great a sinner before God, even after he's offered God the best he is able to give of obedience and commitment. Only he who wholly accepts God's word gets down to the rock foundation of the heart and discovers the law of sin that dwells in him. Only such a one understands that he needs not only repentance, but salvation. But when he understands that if he is to be saved at all, he must be saved by grace, that is a work of God. The third way we try to maintain some control over our life of faith is the trickiest. It's the one that seems the most religious, the most Christian. It's the one that's so prevalent that we might not even see it for what it is. This is the understanding that we have to make a decision for Christ or ask Jesus into our heart or accept Jesus as our savior in order to be saved. On the surface, these things might sound good. Certainly, it seems logical that we would have the free will to decide whether to accept Jesus or not. But this is just one more trick of our little personal gods of control, letting us think we have the power to decide to let Jesus into our hearts. The trouble with this kind of thinking is that it doesn't acknowledge our original sin. The unescapable fact that we are born completely ensnared and enslaved by sin and that without the work of the Holy Spirit, we would never choose faith, 
never accept Jesus as our Lord. It goes against our very human nature, that ledge of granite deep inside. As Paul writes in Romans 3, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. Thinking that you can make a decision for Christ ignores the fact that you are dead. As we read in Ephesians, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Can a dead person make a decision? Of course not. A dead person can't do anything. And every single one of us is completely dead in our sins until the Holy Spirit goes to work on us washing away our guilt and raising us to new life in the waters of baptism, giving us the very faith we need in order to trust in Jesus to save us. And all this by God's grace alone. The best explanation of grace I think I've ever heard came from a children's sermon. I think it explains grace just as well to adults as it does to children, and so I'm going to share it with you today. Pretend that you're on a big ship in the middle of the ocean. Water everywhere, miles and miles of water, and suddenly you fall overboard. What might the captain of that ship do when he or she sees that you've fallen overboard? Would he point in the direction of the land and say, well, a few miles over that way is the land, just start swimming. You'll get there if you swim hard enough. Or do you think the captain, seeing you were drowning in the ocean, might say something to you like, I'll throw you this life ring, but only if you can prove to me that you're really worth saving. What have you done with your life so far? Have you created any useful inventions? Have you won the Nobel Peace Prize or some other important award? Do you think the captain would ask that of you while you were drowning? Or do you think the captain will say, well, if you can climb halfway up the side of the ship, then I'll pull you the rest of the way up. Would the captain try to make you work your way up the side of the ship when he could see that you're drowning? Of course not. He would rescue you, right? The captain would throw you a life preserver or something you could hang on to to keep you afloat or maybe jump in and grab you and pull you to safety. He wouldn't wait for you to try to save yourself. And so it is in life. You are the person drowning and God rescues you not because of anything that you do, not because of anything worthy in you, not waiting for you to contribute something or decide something, but simply because he loves you. We are saved by grace. It's nothing we can brag about, nothing we can contribute to. When you come to Christ, you don't come to give, you come to receive. You don't come to try your best, you come to trust. You don't come just to be saved, but to be rescued. You don't come to be made better, although that does happen. But you are dead, and you come to be made alive. You don't come to Christ to make a promise. You come to receive and depend on his promise. It's the faithfulness of God and not your own that gives you the gift of grace. God's plan of salvation is completely foreign to our sinful selves, the selves who like to be in control. We could never have come up with this idea on our own. We like to think we have good ideas. We like to think our plans are the best plans. We take credit for the good things that happen in our lives. But our plans to be our own salvation don't work out. God has the only plan. As he says in 1 Corinthians, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived 
what God has prepared for those who love him. No, we could never have come up with God's plan on our own. Instead, we joyfully confess the truth that the, although we're unable to earn our way into God's favor or make a decision for Christ because of our sinful natures, God has chosen us and brought us to faith through the work of the Holy Spirit in word and sacrament. God so loved the world that he gave his only son? Yes. God became a human being to save us? Yes. Jesus died on a cross for our sins? Yes. Jesus rose again and gives forgiveness and eternal life as a gift to all who believe? Yes. There is hope for sinners like you and me? Yes. God is with us every single day? Yes. We're going to live forever in heaven by God's grace? Yes. It sounds inconceivable, unbelievable, but it's true. We have never could have thought this up on our own. God's plan is so much better than ours. We are not in control. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn of the day is, What Wondrous Love Is This?
I invite you to stand as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that you are in control and not us. We thank you for the precious gift of salvation that you freely give us, not through anything we do or decide, but only through your grace and the work of your Holy Spirit in our hearts. Bless each one here with the sure and certain promise that that promise is for them. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we thank you for all the many gifts you give us, all the blessings that we sometimes take for granted. We thank you for abundant food and clean, plentiful water. We thank you for safe homes. We thank you for our families, our neighbors, our community. We thank you today for the gift of rain. We ask that you would nourish the earth and prepare it for a new growing season. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Heavenly Father, we lift up all those who are struggling, especially your Christian church on earth, in places where Christians are persecuted for bearing your name. Sustain them, surround them with your care and protection, and uplift your whole church on earth in every place that your truth might be preached and your promise given to all the world. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for this congregation, for our leaders, our church council as they meet today, and for all the ministries of this church and all those who give of their gifts in so many ways. Bless our work here in this community and in the world. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray for our nation. We pray for our president, our Congress, our Supreme Court, all leaders elected and appointed at every level of government. We pray that you would have your will be done, that you would raise up leaders of wisdom and integrity and give them the courage to do what is right, not just what is expedient. Lord, in your mercy. We pray, Heavenly Father, you, that you would turn this nation from all sinful paths that we have taken. We lift up so many things, Lord, that you know are wrong, that we are participating in or accepting or turning a, a blind eye. We pray that you would give us the courage to stand up for what is right and the means and will to make a difference in our own place, among our own families and our own community. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Father, we pray, lifting up the pandemic and pray that it would soon come to a complete end. We thank you for the vaccinations that have already happened and we pray that through this and through whatever other means you would use, we would soon see an end to this time and that things would return to a more normal way of life. We lift up those whose businesses and jobs have been affected by this. We lift up those who are suffering financially or who are ill. We pray you would surround them with your care. 
Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who are grieving, all those who have lost loved ones. We especially lift up the families of Jim Henricks and Sally Trout. We ask that you would comfort them and surround them with your care. Lord, in your mercy. We remember all those who are ill or homebound, those who are living in care centers, those who are in the hospital. We pray especially for Amy Sue, Mike, Scott, Artis, Bob, Darlene, David, Tana, Chuck, Shannon, Shelly, Willie, Dan, Roland, Glenda, Tyson, Lamar, and all others whom we name before you in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy and your good and gracious will. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As you go into the world to serve in Christ's name, be of the mind that whatever gain you have received is counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Cling to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus as Lord, having been found in him and having a righteousness that is not your own, but that comes from God through faith. Forget what lies behind and press on toward the goal for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated for our closing hymn, which is Healer of Our Every Ill.
Go in peace. Serve the Lord.